Well, good morning. It's good to hear chuckles and laughter and fellowship in the uh, sanctuary this morning. It's good to have you here worshiping with us, and thank you to those who are uh, joining in on live stream. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, hear this word from James chapter 5, letter in the New Testament, starting at verse 13. Is there anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if, as, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Interesting that uh, all through the New Testament, uh, even when sickness is a topic, Salvation is the primary concern, yet still the call is for uh, prayer. If you have concerns, if you have illness that you're going through, then call for people to pray with you with the anointing of oil. And we're going to do that this morning. Um, in our worship service, we're going to end off with communion time together. Uh, if you're at home watching in, I hope that you've assembled a little bit of bread and some a juice with you so that you have enough for everybody in the room with you. Uh, we're going to have communion and then afterwards we're just going to ask that we have in the sanctuary an atmosphere of prayer. We'll have Dave put on a little bit of uh, worship music in the background and I'm going to stick around. Others can leave, visit in the foyer, visit outside and uh, I'm going to stick around in here and pray with anybody who would like to. Just come forward and let me know what's uh, on your mind, on your heart. And if you would like, I'll anoint just a little dab of oil on your forehead as obedient to the scriptures. So uh, we're going to do all of those things uh, this morning. On Friday, on my way home from the office, I stopped in the hospital and saw Charles. Uh, he had his knee surgery, which we've been waiting for a while for him to get. And so uh, very grateful that that opportunity opened up for him. Um, it's still the jury's out on how effective it was and if it's going to repair the swelling that he had had trouble with before. So uh, we'll see. But uh, Chuck will be praying for you. And on that, let us open in prayer as a congregation today. Our Father in heaven, we come before you with all of our cares and concerns. Uh, some of us have had a great week, and things are uh, plugging along smooth and normal, and we give you glory and praise and honor and credit for that. Uh, but others, there's been difficulty, there's been hardship, uh, things are tough. And so we pray your grace into those situations. Lord, be with each and every one who is hurting. We pray for our brother Chuck in hospital as he recovers. Uh, let him be home quickly, let him be mobile quickly. Let him get full use and restoration of a full range of movement in his knee. Uh, let the pain subside and especially take care of the issue with the swelling, which has been a bit of a burden. So, uh, Lord, we give him into your care, asking that you watch over his body with your healing hand. And others who are uh, going through physical ailment, uh, we ask that you be with them as well. Uh, we think of, of Brad and we ask that you would pour your grace upon him and uh, uh, strengthen him by your might and touch him with your hand directly. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for assembling us in a place, in a time of worship. I thank you for the camaraderie and fellowship of a church family and ask your blessing upon us as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. How about we uh, stand? We've got a couple worship songs for you, and we'll sing along with those. Let's stand together. We'll be singing at the cross in the key of C. There's a place where mercy reigns and never
singing Love Move First in the key of A. Well, I have been thinking of a certain friend of mine this week. Mr. Ellis, I've been thinking about you. We're going to talk about fishing today. And I know Wes likes to fish. Who, here else, who else here likes to fish? We have a few fisher people in the crowd. I am not. That was something that my dad and my brother did together. And the girls were not invited. The one and only time that I have been fishing was in Mexico City. They took us to a park and 
we fished and with a Barbie fishing rod about this big, I caught my one and only fish. And so how many fish can you catch with a pole at a time if you're lucky? One, right? So if you want to catch a lot of fish, what do you use? A lot of poles. <laughs> yes, there are people in the ocean that are sitting with their poles, catching a fish at a time to feed people. You use what? You use a, a net, right? Now, here's the thing, though. With a net, you're going to catch a lot of different things, aren't you? And... I don't think it works very well for people to go down with their scuba gear and try and sort it out in the water. You pull the net in, and then you sort out what you've got in your catch, right? So I have caught a few different things here this morning, and I'm going to get you guys to help me sort them out. Are you ready, Alicia? Can you help me from back there? I'm going to get you to give me a thumbs up if you think it's a good fish. And if it's not a good fish, give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down. Yes, thumbs up if it's good, thumbs down if it's not. All right, let's start with this. What do we think about this fish? Looks just like a nice regular fish. I've got the thumbs up from Susan back there. We're going to keep this fish. This will be in the, the keep pile, okay? All right, what about? This fish, Alicia's given the thumbs down. I think you're right, Alicia. That fish looks pretty sick. I do not think I would like to eat that fish. So that's in the discard pile. All right. Oh, something I think has already gotten at this one. You think you should eat this one, Alicia? I don't know. I don't know what's already been added. I think we'll put it in the discard pile. All right. What about this one here? Oh, I'm losing them all. That's okay. What about this one? It's kind of got a weird smell to it. What do we think? Yeah, no, I don't think so. Let's get rid of that one. All right. How about... Oh my, this one is green, like radioactive green. What do we think? Ah, thumbs down. We're, our catch isn't doing so good here. What about this one? <laughs> Poison. Well, then I guess we don't want to eat it, do we? Okay, now how about... He's cute, but would you want to eat your goldfish? No. Thumbs down, right? Okay. We need some more good fish here. There's not a lot to this one. I think that's just a given. All right. I know. I know there's more good fish here. Oh, this one looks like a keeper. All right, let's put it in this pile over here. Oh, well, thank you for helping me sort my fish. Oh, well, we've been talking about some parables that Jesus told, stories that he told, and the one he told was about a net. And in the net, there were some fish that were good, they were kept, and they represented the righteous, people who have chosen to follow God. And then there was fish that, for one reason or another, weren't good for eating, and they got discarded, and they represent people, the unrighteous, the wicked, people who have chosen not to follow God. And we don't like to talk about it a lot. We like to talk about heaven, don't we? And that is the reward for people who have chosen to follow him. But there are also people who have made the choice not to. And there are consequences for that choice. And someday, they will face the consequences for that choice, that decision. And what is that? It's separation from God, isn't it? Eternal separation in a place that we don't like to talk about very much, but that's hell, isn't it? And 
So my hope and my prayer for each one of us this morning is that we have chosen to follow God and we have that hope of heaven someday and that you're part of the good catch. <laughs> all right. Take care and thank you all. And I think now Tom is coming to bring us an announcement. morning church family hey, greetings can I take <laughs> greetings from the nominating committee of Peterborough Free Methodist Church as you know our church has an annual meeting each spring to plan for the coming ministry year one of the tasks is at the meeting is to elect in certain volunteer leaders for positions within the church, especially those who are dealing with church finances. It is important that we follow all due diligence and proper confidentiality in handling donations and donor information while being transparent in our expenses. While well, one of the groups we need to elect is the official board. The board is essentially the representative decision makes on behalf of the congregation throughout the year. It is practical for the whole church to meet for every decision needing to be made in the year. That's where the church board comes in. They meet on a regular basis, almost monthly, to pray together, review together, and look ahead together. And they do this on behalf of the whole congregation, taking your opinions and comments into consideration when they deliver, deliberate. The nominating committee must submit names as potential board members for you to consider electing at the annual meeting. We take this task seriously. We look at the full list of members in the church because anyone serving on the board needs to be a member first. We consider giftness, we consider experience, we consider a variety of members in terms of age and gender, we consider a person's steadfastness in faith, and we consider where they may already be serving within the church. We also make sure to ask you for suggestions too, although since every board member needs to be a member of the church, we really do consider every available person already. Sorry. <clears throat> We also try to invite new people to the board while experienced people bring a much needed stability. We also must consider two things. First, fresh voices in leadership, and two, we must give people a chance to gain experience. So they too will be one day experienced board members and leaders, and who knows, maybe even ordained and called ministers of Jesus. This is no small task and we take it very seriously. So let me give you a quick update. The nominating committee has met four times in preparation for this year's annual meeting, which is March the 8th. But our task is not yet complete. Our hope is to find nine board members. So far, we have found six nominees. The treasurer would take seventh spot, and then we still need two more. So here is our appeal. First, please pray. Pray for the right candidates who God is preparing even now. Then if a name comes to mind that you would like to consider, then please let us know. You need to verify that they are a member of our church already, and you should ask them ahead if they would be interested in serving. Then give their name to the nominating committee, and we will talk to them. You can, talk, you can contact any of the members of the nominating committee, which are Doris Hicks, John Bandy, and myself, Tom Hardy. Thank you. your name on high in the key of G. And if you know the actions, do them too.
Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, so we've looked at uh, last couple of weeks some parables uh, regarding the Kingdom of Heaven, the Kingdom of God. Uh, those terms are, are fairly much used interchangeably. It puts me in mind of uh, the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew and uh, the, the phrase is used, uh, the Kingdom of Heaven is at hand. I was thinking about that, and I, I sometimes try and think of if I was a first-time reader of the Bible, and I haven't been a first-time reader of the Bible in a long time, <clears throat> so trying to put myself in those shoes, trying to look at it from, I don't know the background, I, don't, I do know. I don't know uh, the rest of the story. If I was reading it for the first time, what would I think about the words I'm encountering? And uh, I think this phrase would confuse me. Um, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> the, be the beginning of Matthew, uh, do you remember how it starts different, different sections? It, it's got the genealogy of Jesus, right? It begins with that, and, and that's purposeful. It's not just a random list of names. It ties Jesus to uh, Old Testament prophets, Old Testament promises, and it, it sets up Matthew's telling of the gospel, the telling of the, the life of Jesus. It sets him up as the fulfillment of everything that came before. All of God's purposes on earth fulfilled in Jesus. And, and that's tied in through the genealogy. And so that's why that's there at the beginning of, of the book of Matthew. And, and then Matthew goes on and, and he goes into some detail about the birth story of Jesus, right? And, and that's got a couple of important elements as well. Uh, it establishes him as the son of God. This isn't Mary and Joseph's child. This is uh, God's child through Mary. And so therefore, what does that imply? It implies the sinlessness of Christ. It implies his purity and perfection, and he is without sin, which is important if he is going to be the sacrifice for the salvation of all sins of all humanity ever. He needs to be established as pure and holy. And the birth story does that. And then uh, there's, there's the story where um, he escapes to Egypt, him and his family, and then they come back to Nazareth. And, and in that whole story, you see God's provision over Jesus. And then you get to the part in the early chapters of the book of Matthew, you have Jesus' baptism and you have him going into the wilderness and he's, he's tempted by no less than Satan directly. How many times? Three times. That's an easy one. That was a soft lob to you all. Three times he was tempted. And three times he refuted temptation with truth. 
and with the Scriptures. And so you've got these different sections uh, which quickly, Matthew is purposefully writing in the order that he's writing to paint the picture of Jesus for us all to understand. And he has all these sections there. And then it gets to this phrase. And this phrase is said by two different people, by John the Baptist and Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, John the Baptist says it. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus says it. And they each say at different times and over and over again, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what does that mean, at hand? Well, that means now. That means presently. That means currently. That doesn't mean in a little while the kingdom of heaven will be here. It means now the kingdom of heaven is here. It is now. And we understand that as the kingdom of heaven arrives because Jesus arrived. But it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. Where is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom? When we look at our world, do we understand that the kingdom of heaven is here? If I simply read through the rest of the Gospels, I'm going to encounter this. What is the faith of John the Baptist? John the Baptist, the one who is sent by God to introduce the coming of Jesus into the world, this is, this is God's workman. This is the preparer of the path for Jesus to come. This is the one who is calling people to repentance. He's declaring the coming of the kingdom. What's his fate in the Gospels? Yeah, <laughs> no one wants to say it. They're making the motion. <laughs> He's executed. Why? For telling truth. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And one of the ones who declared that himself is executed in our world unjustly. Peter's mother-in-law in Luke chapter 4, she was ill with a fever. Yes, Jesus came and healed her. But the kingdom of heaven is at hand and, and still people are getting sick, even ones who are close to the ones Jesus has as his disciples. There's still people falling into illness. The kingdom of heaven is at hand and still people are falling into illness. Uh, we look later on in the Gospels. We have a man named Jairus. His daughter died. Now Jesus did a miracle there too. But that was still happening. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. But still these, these things are tragic in people's lives. were still happening. Not the least of which is Jesus himself goes to the cross. Unjustly pursued. Uh, they wanted to destroy him, and this was the religious leaders. The political leaders allowed him to be destroyed on the cross. This is what happened to him in a world where the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And those words were declared somewhere around 2,000 years ago when Jesus and John the Baptist were walking around on the earth. Well, what about today? What's today look like? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you look around, does it look like that? Sometimes not. Sometimes not. Right now, I see a lot of anger. I see lots of anger in our world. I hear all the classic questions too. As a pastor, you've probably encountered these questions, but as a pastor, I, <laughs> I get them all the time. Why do bad things happen to good people, Pastor? Why does that happen? And the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why does that still happen? Why did my wife get cancer? Guy asked me that in the hospital one time. Face was red from crying his eyes out. Why did my wife? She didn't deserve it. Why did this happen to her? Why do children get ill? Why does that happen? Why are people so polarized and unable to see the other one's perspective? We talk about uh, 
walk a mile in someone else's shoes before you judge them. But we got judgment happening all over the place right now. Polarized opinion, polarized conversations. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and this is what the world looks like still. And we've got it pretty good compared to other times in history and compared to uh, other people and, and the things they have to live through. Where is the kingdom? Now, um, don't tune out. If you're watching on YouTube, oh, Pastor Dan is really depressed this morning. I'm not watching this. It, don't, don't go there. <laughs> we're talking about uh, Jesus' perspective on this. And so here's where we're going. Jesus has a wonderful, gracious um, statement, words of comfort for us in this parable of the net. And it's in Matthew chapter 13. It's verses 47 to 50. Um, I, I'm going to read it. it. It certainly has a judgment aspect to it. Undeniable. But they are also words of grace. And we're going to explain why. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we do need to understand the imagery here. And uh, uh, Pastor Holly was, was right on with uh, getting us thinking outside of how we normally typically think of fishing with rod and reel. Uh, you cast, you, you try and catch one fish. And uh, uh, here we go with in Jesus' mind, in Jesus' world, in the listener's world, it was net fishing. Um, in, in fact, some of his disciples were fishermen, weren't they? Who, who was? Do you remember? Peter and Andrew and James and John. He actually, he recruited them into his uh, uh, little troop of disciples and apostles right on the shores while they were in the business of fishing which they left behind to become, what did he call them? Fishers of men, right? So uh, this kind of imagery made perfect sense to them. Not only that, but do you know where Jesus was when he was telling this parable and using this imagery? Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 and 2 uh, is, is the beginning of this whole next uh, series of paragraphs that all flow one into the other. But this is all in the context of Jesus going over to the uh, shores of the sea and sitting down. But then crowds started to gather around him and so many were pressing in. What did he do? Where did he speak from? <laughs> he got into a boat, went out from the shore, and that's where he's talking to everybody from. So, he makes this analogy of uh, fishing, and it's net fishing, uh, that's what's going on. So, what's the point of fishing? It's to catch the good fish, the useful fish. Now, if we ask too many pressing questions about this parable, then we're going to decide we don't even want to be the good fish, because what happens to the good fish? <laughs> they go to market and get eaten. So we don't, we might not really want to be the good fish, but it's not about the final state of the fish. It's about the sorting, right? Isn't that what the parable is about? It's about the sorting and what happens in the sorting. And, and if, if the, the fate of the good fish is uh, to be cleaned up, go to market and be useful to a family. Uh, the alternative is much worse. It's thrown away. Dumped over the side. 
gotten rid of. Nobody wants it. It will not be included. They will not be let in. Who then, because it's clear, Jesus, Jesus explains the parable right in the telling of the parable. This isn't about fish, good fish or bad fish. This is about people and persons. And assorting that will happen one day. So who are the ones who deserve to be thrown away? Well, uh, if we polled people, we would get a list. We get a list of the kinds of people who it's obvious they would be thrown away. They would not be allowed in the kingdom. They would not be allowed to remain. They would be thrown away. Terrorists, abusers, dictators, that kind of thing. We'd, we'd come up with a list. What about someone who's told a lie? Do they deserve to get cast away? What about someone who stole something once? Do they deserve to be cast away? Or could, could they be allowed in and, and put into the, the good bucket? What about someone who has dishonored their father or mother? What about someone who has cast an envious eye at another person, the things that they have? When you start listing out some of the Ten Commandments, when you start listing out some of the laws of, laws of God, all of a sudden, <clears throat> who's the bad people becomes not some uh, grand acts of evil, and that is so obvious, but it becomes things about, well, actually, I've done that in my own life, too. So now it's personal, and now it's real, and now it's sobering. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves. Well, I have to say, there's a lot of people that deceive themselves uh, in our society. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here's the reality is all deserve to be thrown overboard. Even me. Even you. Right? But here's the hope. God does not want you to be thrown out. I want to look at the Gospel of John, chapter 3. It's a very famous verse. Many of you will even have it uh, memorized. In John chapter 3, there's verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So that's, that's the truth of what's on offer. Whoever believes in Him could have eternal life. But here's the motivation behind Sometimes we, we memorize verse 16, but we don't go on and, and remember what verse 17 says. This is the motive. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Do you know the last thing God wants? Is this. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want that to be people. He doesn't want people thrown out of the kingdom, kept out of the kingdom, sorted out of the kingdom. That's not what he wants. He wants all to come into proper, restored, loving relationship with him. That's his, that's his purpose. That's his desire. He doesn't want anyone cast out. And so the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like a net that's around all the fish. The good fish and the bad fish. So that they would have time to turn from their sin and turn towards God. This, this parable is a parable of patience. Where is the kingdom of God? It, it's here, but, but 
he can't just start already plucking out the bad. Because if he starts plucking out the bad, who's going to be left? Yeah, no, nobody's the right answer. <laughs> Some of you are thinking of, uh, I'd be left. Well, no, you wouldn't be. Right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if in the immediacy of the sin, God starts plucking out the evil ones, dumping them out and casting them away, there'd be none left. So therefore, the net, the kingdom of heaven, is a patient thing. It's cast over all so that there is time for them to come to salvation and get to know him and be worthy of remaining with him in the kingdom. It gives people a chance to acknowledge him before it's too late. And, and the casting out, whatever you want to call it, you want to call it... Uh, Hell or Gehenna or the second death or the outer darkness. Scripture uses these various terms. At the very least, it's regret. And it is, as Pastor Holly said earlier, it is separation from God. And, and that would be an awful thing. That we could have relationship with God, yet by, by our own choosing, uh, we have not relationship with him. Therefore, um, we are separated out. God does not want that for us. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So how do we then tell the good fish from the bad? When I was, uh, when I was younger, um, uh, we used to do quite a bit of fishing, and, and I had a poster, something like this. I don't have the poster anymore, but I had a poster, something like this, uh, on my bedroom wall. And, and uh, we caught lots of these different kinds of fish. Never caught catfish. That's not something we ever did. But um, pike, you've caught catfish, Jack? Yeah. <laughs> you had lots there. <laughs> yeah. So I know people do. They fish for cat. I never did. But um, pike we used to catch lots of pike. We used to go for those because they were they were big guys, and and uh, we get those on the line. Um, if you get the if you get the smaller ones from shallow water, they they taste lakey. But if you get ones that are nice and deep, caught one one time in Georgian Bay with a downrigger, and uh, that was that was good eating. No, that was that was pike that we got. Yep. Yep. It's good when it's in cold, fresh, deep water. Uh, do you call them here in Ontario walleye or pickerel? <laughs> so apparently the answer is it depends who you ask. <laughs> uh, OS Saskatchewan. There's there's lots of them, and uh, they call them pickerel out there. Um, you go into northern Saskatchewan, and uh, man, we went on a canoe trip one time. You put your line in, you had one on. You brought it in, you put your line in, you had one on. Four canoes, all of them had fish on at the same time. It was, it was brilliant. And walleye, pickerel is really good eating. And you can, you can fillet them with minimal bones. None, if you're, if you're good enough. Decent. Northern pike is a hard one to clean. You always get bones with those. Yeah. Perch. You ever intentionally caught perch for for eating? Yeah. So so they're like walleye, but they're littler. <laughs> and so we were ice fishing one time, uh, caught perch, and I'm I'm throwing them back. My buddy goes, "What are you doing?" Well, it's perch. <laughs> so, no, you keep them. So we had like 50. And then it's minus 25, and we had to clean 50 perch. So your hands are freezing, and you get little bite-sized morsels off of them. Then I went uh, fishing one time with friends and caught something that wasn't on my chart. I, I, what did you call it? 
Yeah. Um, Barbet is what I found. That's out west. They called them Moriah. We caught this thing. It was the ugliest thing I ever saw come out of a lake. It was like half fish and half eel, and and he caught it, and it was a half decent size one. And so he caught it. I didn't catch it. He caught it, and uh, it come up, and it's wiggling wrapped around his arm like it was just gross. It looked like an oversized tadpole. Uh, so, so the side view lets you see that it's like an eel, but the top view, like the body was rotund and then had this eel-like tail, right? We, <clears throat> we tried to eat it. So we thought, well, people must, I mean, they, they do. I've found since that they do. People eat it, but I had two bites. <clears throat> the, it just shriveled right up. It was just the weirdest thing. <clears throat> if I'm sorting good fish from bad, it's not going to be hard for me to do. It's going to be easy. The ones on the chart go in the good bucket. Those other ones, <laughs> they, they go back down the hole. The sorting's not hard. It's obvious. You look at it. You look at the character. You don't even have to examine it all that closely. It's obvious where it goes. The fishermen in Jesus' day, uh, their division was, if it had scales and fins, it goes in the good bucket. Everything else doesn't. The sorting is simple with fish. I think that's kind of the point Jesus is making. One day, the angels will come and they will separate out the humans, the good from the bad, under God's direction, of course, under guidance. And Jesus is the final judge. We're clear on that, right? The angels aren't judging. The angels are just sorting. How come they get to do that? Because it's easy. Because it's obvious. It's not difficult. It won't be hard to spot the righteous from the unrighteous. And the sorting will be simple. But how will the angels know how to separate the humans on that day of judgment? How will they know? Romans 10.9 If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. It's not hard sorting. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not hard sorting. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and other things will be added to you as well. Seek first His kingdom. It's not hard sorting. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. It's not hard sorting. Matthew 16, 24. If anyone would come after Me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Me. It's not hard sorting. Is there the excitement in you of the one who uh, found treasure in the field so, uh, bought the field to get the treasure. The one who found the pearl sold everything to find the pearl. Is that how you pursue God? If that's how you pursue God, it's not going to be hard. It's not going to be hard for you to be sorted into the good bucket. bucket. Anyway. You'll be one of the kingdom. Others will be sorted out. And that's sad. We don't want that to happen. God doesn't want that to happen. But if they won't pursue Him, it, it's going to be obvious what needs to happen next. So let us be people of the kingdom. Let us be people who pursue the kingdom. Let us be people who never tire of the kingdom. Let us be people who confess our sins and ask forgiveness and give ourselves over to Him. 
And then on that day of sorting, um, we'll be in the kingdom because it will be obvious we need to be. Amen. So we're going to sing another song um, in preparation for uh, the communion table this morning. We're going to go through communion liturgy, which is a, a preset of words that uh, we read through. And, and I, I like using a liturgy. I've been in too many services where communion is done quickly at the end of a service and over. And I like to make sure that we review the truths that we hold together as a congregation. And so we'll read through the liturgy together and uh, receive communion. So let us stand for this song, Preparing Our Hearts. We'll be singing Come to the Table in the Key of C. Just a word about communion. Um, in our tradition, the Free Methodist Church, uh, we hold an open table uh, theology. Uh, essentially, if you are here with us this morning and you would like to participate in communion, then you are more than welcome to do so. We actually believe that's God's grace in your life, uh, inviting you in your heart uh, to participate if you want to. Um, so whatever your tradition, background, 
uh, you are welcome to participate in communion this morning if you would like to. If you don't want to, there's no pressure. You don't have to. Um, just listen along to the words that are said and uh, the prayers and just learn from these things and uh, try to understand the best you can what's going on. If you do want to participate in communion this morning and you didn't pick up your little um, prepackaged cup when you came in the foyer, um, please feel free to now go get one. Uh, don't be embarrassed if you have to get up and, and go do that. So, I'm going to read through the liturgy. There are parts that uh, we'll have you read uh, together along with. So the invitation. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking henceforth in His holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament for your comfort, and humbly bowing, make your honest confession to Almighty God. And let's read this next section, the general confession. Let's read it all together, okay? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, maker of all things, judge of all people, who with great mercy has promised forgiveness and deliverance to all who turn to you with hearty repentance and true faith. We confess that we have sinned against you and are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy upon us, O merciful Father. Have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins, from blindness of heart and lack of love, from the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, from false doctrine and neglect of your word, from disbelief and lack of trust. O God, our Savior, Keep us this day without sin. Give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have faithfully watched over us and graciously helped us. Now hear our petitions. For good health and sound minds. For strength to earn our bread for rest from worry and labor, for safety in travel, for protection from enemies, for Christian homes, and for a just and strong nation. Out of your compassion, give us those things which are good and proper for our souls, and protect us by your might in all our tribulations. Grant us in this world the peace that is from above, and bring us to everlasting life in the world to come, through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who created the world from nothing and who sustains it by your powerful word, support and protect us that we may serve you as intercessors in your world. And to that end, hear our prayers for those in need, for the sick, the infirm, and the aged for widows and orphans, the poor and oppressed, for the lonely, discouraged, bereaved, and heartbroken, for those in bondage to sin, unmindful of God, without knowledge of the gospel of salvation. We pray too for all your servants who honor Christ in their work. And let's pray these next lines together. For homemakers and wage earners, for teachers and students, for doctors, nurses, and others who serve the sick, for laborers and executives, for farmers and city dwellers, for the aged and the young, for those who govern and those who are ruled, 
to each of these and to all others for whom we should pray, give wisdom, strength, and the power to endure through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, You created us to enjoy Your fellowship, and even when we transgressed Your command, You did not forsake us, but You chastened us as a merciful Father. You called Abraham from the land of his fathers and freed the children of Israel from bondage and slavery. You gave Your law and sent Your prophets to guide them in Your ways. At the right time, You gave the world Your only Son, who by His birth to a virgin and through his temptations in ministry, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, opened to us the way to heaven. You sent your Holy Spirit, the Counselor, who through the apostles and the church called us to salvation. You adopted us and daily give us aid in the journey of faith by that same Spirit. And so our hearts are full, O oh God, and in thanksgiving to you we cry, Abba, Father. In confidence that you will bring us to our full inheritance and give us our place at the heavenly table with your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, 